We're going to be, I know you got the little papers when you were passed in, when you came in, were passed out to you to take notes on. Although we're not doing uh, prescriptions for a healthy life tonight, I'm actually taking tonight and next Wednesday night, and we're going to do a two-part study on the book of Job. Now, I want to encourage you, take some time, read it tonight, read it this week, and if some of the things I share tonight provoke questions within you, hang on to them. I'm not going to be doing any private Bible studies after service tonight. <laughs> so uh, don't come and say, well, yeah, what about this? You just have to hang on till next week, and uh, we'll get through everything, hopefully, that the Lord has put on my heart. But I'd like to start tonight by asking you a few questions, if I might, and you can open your Bible to the book of Job, chapter 1, if you like. Um, we'll also be in the, the book of James, so you might want to put a finger in James. But uh, here's the questions. Question number one, does God do evil? The answer to that is no. James 1 and verse 13 says, Let no man say when he's tested, I am tested by God. For it is not possible for God to be tested by evil, and he himself puts no man to such a test. God tests no one with evil. God does not do evil. God is good. Second question. Could Satan trick or provoke God into doing anything? He wouldn't be much of a God if the devil could. The answer to that one's obviously no. Number three. Is God like the mafia boss and Satan his henchman? God calls for the hit. Satan does his bidding by carrying out the evil, but you can't really pin it on God because he actually never got his hands dirty. He sent Satan to do that. Obviously, no. Yet that is some people's theology when it comes to to God. So the question arises in many people's minds, and I've heard it asked a lot of times throughout the 40 plus years I've been walking with Jesus. Well, what about Job then? What about Job? I remember as a <clears throat> brand new Christian, I was living in Oregon at the time, and I went into a local supermarket. They had a a pastry section in the back and a couple of picnic benches back there. And I got a cup of coffee and a pastry and I sat down with my Bible and a couple came in and they were maybe, maybe in their 50s. Wouldn't be much older than that. And the wife came in briskly and sat down. She had her husband in tow and you could tell he had a lot of difficulty moving. It was obvious that he was in pain. Um, he was hindered physically, moved really slowly, lethargically. I could tell when he sat down, his, his breathing was labored. And I think the, the lady mentioned something about my Bible. I said, yeah, I've just given my life to the Lord. I'm a new Christian. She said, that's awesome. And we began to talk, having some good fellowship. And she began to bring up her husband's situation. She said, yeah, he's just had his seventh heart attack. And just got through another surgery, and the prognosis is not good. It looks like it's actually downhill from here. And she just went on and on talking about his condition. And, and you know, in, in the newness of my faith and, and, you know, simplicity of heart, I said, well, let's pray for your husband. I actually had not yet embraced the concept that someone would not want to be prayed for if they were a, a Christian. She says, oh, no, we're not going to pray for my husband. I said, but why? I'll never forget it. I'm a brand-new Christian, sitting there with my bear claw and my coughing. <laughs> she said, my husband is like Job. God has afflicted him. God gave him these heart attacks, and praying won't do any good because God is the one responsible. My husband is a Job. Now, he never said a word the entire time we were there. His wife did all the talking. He never said anything. 
And it just struck me so sideways. And I know as a new Christian, I said, you know, I don't think God gave your husband all those heart attacks. And she got really mad at me and jumped up from the table, grabbed her husband, said, honey, we're going, and sort of dragged him out of the supermarket. And I just sat there scratching my head. The whole thing, it just baffled me. Um, first, that, that not interested in prayer. Pr prayer wouldn't do any good because God's the one that's perpetrated this on my husband, and my husband is just like Job. And I think many people have used the book of Job to explain the mystery of why the righteous suffer. They say, well, God's permitting it, and they're like Job. And most people, when they think of Job, they think of someone that suffered all his life without ever being rescued, without ever being healed, without ever experiencing freedom or deliverance. But the truth is, Job was delivered. Job was rescued. Job did get healed. So if we're going to claim to be like Job, then we should look forward to the same kind of ending that he experienced as well. Now, in James chapter 5 in the New Testament, we're very specifically told the message that we should be gleaning and gathering from the book of Job. And I'd like you to look there with me if you would. James chapter 5 and verse 11. This is what the New Testament teaches us that is the main lesson we should be getting as we read the book of Job. James 5 and 11. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. You've seen what the Lord did in the end. Some people have never read to the end. That the, the story that James tells us that we, we should be getting is one of mercy and compassion and blessing. Listen to it from the Amplified Bible, that verse. It says, You know we call those blessed happy, spiritually prosperous, favored by God, who were steadfast and endured difficult circumstances. You have heard of the patient endurance of Job and have seen the Lord's outcome, how he richly blessed Job. The Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. And then the next few verses that we want to read, all of them relate directly back to the story of Job, verse 12 in James 5. But above all, my brethren, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no, no, lest you fall into judgment. That's actually something Job did in chapter 16, and it got him into trouble. Verse 13 of James 5. Is anyone among you suffering like Job? Let him pray like Job did. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick like Job was? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save or heal the sick. And the Lord will raise him up just like Job was raised up. And if he's committed sins, he'll be forgiven just like Job was. Confess your trespasses to one another just like Job did. And pray for one another just like Job did for his friends that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Almost every one of those statements relates directly back to events that took place in the book of Job. And it all begins, God says, says hey, you've seen what God did in the end of the story. God is merciful. He's compassionate. He richly blessed Job. And here's some of the lessons from the book. So that should be not the only, perhaps, but it should be the main lesson that we get from the book. Now, many people are finding a different message. They're not finding a message of hope and healing, but one of perpetual suffering. Listen to the last chapter, if you would, verse 42, and, or chapter 42, verse 10 says, and the Lord restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. Indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. 
Verse 12, now the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. That's the message. You know, years ago, it was in previous building to this one, I was in the foyer talking to people, and a lady came up to me. I gathered it was her first time at the church. Somebody had brought her, and I, I said hi to her, and she, she shared with me right away. She said, you know, I've, I've just lost my husband. And my heart started to broke for her. I said, I'm so sorry. And I talked to her for a few moments. I said, what, was he a believer? She says, oh, yes. You know, he had a strong faith in Jesus. I said, well, thank God for that. You know, at least we, we know where he is. You know, he's with the Lord now, but I'm, I'm so sorry for your loss. And th that was about the end of the conversation. I was really taken aback when about a week later I got a letter from this woman, a very angry letter. And in the letter, she said, basically, how dare you tell me that it's wrong to grieve for the loss of my husband? And how dare you tell me that I have no faith? And I, me I remember reading the letter and thinking, what? I didn't say that. That's the exact opposite of the message that I was endeavoring to convey to her. And, and I just, you know, I read through the letter and I wrote her a nice little note back. I said, I'm so sorry if that's what you got from what we said. It's not what I intended to communicate to you and never, never heard from her again. But whatever filters, you know, she had up, she filtered everything I said through those and she actually gathered the exact opposite of the message that I actually spoke and that I intended. And some people have done that with the book of Job. I would like to say regardless of what you may be suffering right now in your life, regardless of your circumstance, you should be able to and I should be able to look to the book of Job and find hope there. Job got through his struggles. God was faithful to Job. God was merciful, and the Lord does not change. But many, they have failed to do that, mostly because they're concentrating on the disaster rather than the deliverance. They're concentrating on the mess rather than the mercy. And some people are not receiving answers because their eyes are in the wrong place. You know, in Numbers 21, when the Israelites were bitten by the serpents and they were dying, those that became absorbed with their snake bites didn't find deliverance. But those that looked to the answer, the bronze serpent, they got an answer. It all had to do with where their focus was. And so our focus for the book of Job should be what the Lord did in the end. And I think... Another thing that is added to the confusion surrounding this book is that many people have not read it in the light of New Testament revelation. People have taken things from the book, things spoken by Job and by others in the book, and they've taken them and applied them as New Testament doctrine. Things like, well, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Job said that. He also said, shall we receive good at the hand of the Lord, and shall we not receive evil? I've heard that quoted as well as New Testament doctrine. Job also said, God crushes people and multiplies their wounds without cause or reason. He doesn't discri discriminate. He destroys the blameless and the wicked. Should we take that as well as New Testament doctrine? It's as much a statement by Job as the other things were. Now see, when we look at the book, in the light of the New Testament and what's revealed there, it clears up much of the misunderstanding. You see, Job is thought to be the oldest book in the Bible. The author is unknown. It occurred in a time before Moses, before the law, there was no Old Testament in the time of Job. There was no New Testament in the time of Job. There were no scriptures at all when Job experienced the things that he experienced. People knew very little about God, and they knew even less about their adversary, the devil. 
They assumed that all good and all bad came from God. Job's servants assumed that God was responsible for all Job's losses, for the death of all ten of his children, for his wife turning against him, for him losing all of his possessions, for him becoming sick, for him becoming a laughingstock and being taunted by people. His servants thought God had done it. Job's wife thought God was responsible for it. Job thought God was responsible, and so did his friends. In fact, the majority of the book, almost the entirety of the book, is one conversation that takes place in one day, really an argument between Job and his friends. Job's friends say over and over, Job, God is doing this to you. God is breaking you down. God is afflicting you because you're an evil man. You have done wicked and you need to admit it. That's why God is punishing you. That's why all this evil has befallen you because you're a bad man. Job's argument was basically, look, I agree. God's doing it, but I don't know why because I'm not bad. I'm an honest man. I'm upright. Yeah, God's doing it but it's not for the reasons that you say. And that's just this argument that goes back and forth, chapter after chapter after chapter after chapter. In fact, listen to what Job says. This is Job 9, verses 22 through 24. Job says, it's all one thing. Therefore I say, he, that is God, he destroys the blameless and the wicked. If the scourge slays suddenly, he laughs at the plight of the innocent. The earth is given into the hand of the wicked. He covers the faces of its judges. If it is not he, who else could it be? Job said, look, if God's not doing it, who's doing it then? He didn't know. He figured it had to be God. Now see, we'll read the first chapter of the book of Job And God will draw back the curtain of the natural for us and show us what was happening behind the scenes and who was responsible for what happened. But you have to remember, Job couldn't open to Job chapter 1 and read what we're about to read. (laughs) There was no scripture at all. And Job plainly admits, he said, look, You know, he he destroys the the wicked and the righteous together. He laughs at the plight of the innocent. Doesn't sound like our God. But he said, look, if he's not doing it, who's doing it? Where's all this coming from? Job had no idea. And so we look in Job chapter 1 and verse 1. We're going to read the first five verses. It says, there was a man in the land of... Uz, or Uz, or the land of Uz and Uz. <clears throat> it was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. That man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and shunned evil. And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. Also his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. And his sons would go and feast in their houses, each on his appointed day, and would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. So it was, when the days of feasting had run their course, that Job would send and sanctify them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did regularly, or thus Job did continually or constantly. Now, it tells us Job was blameless. That doesn't mean that he was flawless or faultless. It's the Hebrew word tom, and it literally means complete. Job was complete in the fact that he was walking in all of the knowledge that he had. He was walking in all the light that he was had. He was honest to the degree that he had understanding, but he had a very limited knowledge of God. 
He was upright. It's the Hebrew word yashar means straight. In other words, he wasn't crooked. He was an honest man, and Job knew that he was honest. He feared God. He turned away from evil. He had ten kids, and he was greater than all the men in the East. He was very wealthy, and he was very godly. It is possible to be both of those things. Now, his sons, daughters, they were grown. They had their own houses. They weren't little kids. They were accountable themselves as adults. It says every time one of the boys had a birthday, they had parties, and the scripture tells us when the days, plural of their feasting, had run their course. So at least seven times a year, they had parties that went on for days. And they were feasting and they were drinking at these parties. And it's interesting, even when the servants come, you know, there's only like two things they say about the kids. And every time the servants speak, the one thing they say about the kids, they were all partying, they were all drinking. It's one of the big things, one of the outstanding features of their parties, these parties that are lasting for days, is they're doing a lot of drinking. Now, they invited their sisters, but it's interesting As we read through chapter 1 and chapter 2, we find out that Job was not invited. I wonder why. Maybe, just like some of your relatives are not super comfortable around you, since you've given your heart to God. I know some people that I was very close with. I remember this girl that I knew went into the restaurant. She was a waitress, and she had one of the other waitresses switch tables with her because she would not wait on me. She was so uncomfortable around me. See, I'd shared the gospel with her, and she wasn't real happy about that. But the, the implication is Job was godly. Perhaps his kids were not. So he continually offers sacrifices to appease God not knowing whether they've done anything or not, but Job continually is thinking, well, maybe they've cursed God. Now, see, he didn't know if they'd done anything or not, but Job knew his kids. Not one time that my kids have ever partied, had a party, been to a party, never one time has the thought crossed my mind, man, I I, I better fast and pray. Maybe they're blaspheming the Holy Spirit. No, I know my kids pretty well. There's not going to be a propensity for that. But Job, continually, he's saying, well, maybe they've cursed God. You know, and and the the big party that's going on, and and there's mostly heathen land around them. Uh, Again, realize this is before Moses, before the laws, before Scripture. So Job, out of fear... Is continually offering these sacrifices, and to do anything out of fear is not good. We need to cast our cares on the Lord. And Job continually voiced this fear. Now, quite likely, Job's fear is what opened the door, as we're going to find out as we read in a little bit, what opened the door to the devil and the lifestyle of his children more than likely opened the door to the destruction that they experienced. Even in chapter 2, verse 9, you know, there's only a record of one sentence that Job's wife ever made. Very short, very concise, very crisp. She said, curse God and die. She's obviously grieving the loss of her children, but she didn't have the relationship with God that Job had. Job is suffering, and to his credit and in his integrity, he's worshiping his wife. She's saying, look, quit worshiping God. Just curse God and die, would you? So it seems that Job may have lost his family somewhere along the way. Maybe because he was so busy with with all of the different business ventures he had. 
the thousands of different kind of animals and the employees and the managers and all of those things. We don't know, but the scripture gives us enough to think about some of those things. And then we come to verse 6 and something striking happens. Job 1 and 6, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan also came among them. Now the phrase here, son of God, refers to the angels and this takes place in heaven. So now we shift from the earth to heaven. And the Hebrew word for Satan literally means adversary. Now the adversary also came among them. God was not Job's adversary. Satan was Job's adversary. My friend, God is not your adversary. The devil is the adversary. And the angels came before God to give an account of what's been going on. And I know somebody says, well, doesn't God already know what's going on? Certainly he does. He knows what you've been doing, but one day you'll have to stand before him and give an account as well. And so the angels are there, and we read in the very next verse, verse 7, And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. Now, First, it tells me the devil is not omnipresent. He's very limited. Great big God, little bitty devil. And Satan said, I've been walking to and fro on the earth, walking back and forth. What is he doing when he's walking around? Did you know the New Testament tells us what Satan is doing when he's walking around? You know the verse, 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So when Satan's walking about, his aim is to find someone that's vulnerable, someone that he can devour. So God says, where you been? I've been walking. We know why he's been walking. He's been looking for someone that he thinks he can devour. And we come to verse 8, Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There's no one like him on earth, blameless, upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. Now it kind of looks like God points Job out and says, Hey, check him out. Why don't, you, why don't you go get him? But actually the word considered, Have you considered my servant Job? It's a compound word in the Hebrew. The first word is set. The second word is heart. Satan comes before his friends. Well, I've been walking back and forth. And God says, oh, you've set your heart on my servant Job. He's upright. He fears me. Turns away from evil. He's the one that you set your heart on. God knew exactly why the devil was there. In fact, the next two verses make it quite clear. Verse 9, so Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him? around his household, around all that he has on every side. You've blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. Satan knew exactly who God was talking about. Yeah, that's who I've been looking at. I've been prodding, I've been poking. Seems like you've got this threefold hedge. Do you not have a hedge up around him, around his family, around all that he has? It's your hand, God, that has caused him to increase in the land. You see, the devil is there because he thinks he's finally found an avenue to attack Job, but he wants to make sure. And the avenue we mentioned would be first through his family, through their lifestyles, but also through Job's fear. Listen to what Job said after all the stuff happened. Job lost family, lost his wealth, lost his health, lost his reputation. This is what he had to say about it, Job 3 and 25. For the thing I greatly feared has come upon me, and what I dreaded has happened to me. The scripture says in Proverbs 10, 24, the fear of the wicked shall come upon him. Now, that is true. 
but it's true in general. Fear is a magnet for things you don't want. Just like faith brings things you do want, faith, I mean, faith brings things you do want, fear brings things that you don't want. Ever since Adam let fear into the garden, it has been a, it has been a destroyer of mankind ever since. Now, God had put up a hedge, this threefold hedge around Job, but just like Job, just like his family, God has a hedge around us. We can tear the hedge down. In Ecclesiastes chapter 10, it says, whoever breaks down a hedge will be bitten by a serpent. It's exactly what happened to Job. The hedge was down, at least partially, and he's about to be bitten by the serpent. So we come to verse 11. The devil says, but now stretch out your hand. Hebrew word yod. God, stretch out your hand and touch all that he has. And he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your power. Hebrew word yod. All that he has is in your hand. Only lay not a hand on his per person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. So the devil says, hey, stretch out your hand, God. God says, no, but all that he has is in your hand. I'm not going to stretch out my hand against him. Now, said God wouldn't cover it up. The devil's there and asking, hey, isn't there a hedge up? There a hedge around all that he has? Is it there? Is it there? Now, God's not going to lie even to the devil. The devil's trying to get God. Remember we asked the question when we began, is the devil going to trick God or incite God to do something evil? No, God does not do evil. But God doesn't lie, even to the devil. He says, no, all that he has is in your hand. Yeah, the hedge is down, but don't touch his life. And so Satan leaves the presence of the Lord, and now we shift again from the heavens to the earth. And we come to... Verse 13, now there was a day, this immediately happens when the devil leaves. Now there was a day when the sons and daughters, when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house, and a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing, donkeys feeding beside them, when the Sabaeans raided them and took them away. Indeed, they have killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone am escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, the fire of God, a phrase to refer to lightning, fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, the Chaldeans formed three bands, raided the camels, took them away, and killed the servants with the edge of the sword and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house, and suddenly a great wind came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Who's responsible for all that? That's the work of the devil's hand, my friend. It wasn't God's hand. It was the devil's hand. And that hedge was broken down. You know, my, my wife comes from a family of dairy farmers. Her father had a small dairy farm. I think about 50 cows on the farm. It was, it was a small sustenance farm. And one day, lightning struck out in the field. How many of dad's cows did it kill, babe? Six. Like more than 10% of all the livestock he had killed in a moment. That's devastating when that's how you're taking care of your family. She's one of nine siblings. And I still remember her talking about how her dad just went out and sat under a tree with six of his top producing cows laying dead in the field. Well, friend, God did not send that lightning to kill the cows of Janet's father. 
And God didn't send the lightning to burn up all the sheep and all the servants of Job. And God didn't send the wind, you know, the hurricane that caused the house to cave in that killed all ten of his children. No, it's the devil that's influencing all these raiders and influencing these people to do evil and perverting the forces of nature. I mean, when Jesus would get into a boat to go to the other side, a great storm of wind would arise. And Jesus would say, Father, I don't know why you're doing this, but I submit to it. No, Jesus would rebuke the wind. He wasn't working against his Father. The Father wasn't working against him. He rebuked the wind just like he rebuked evil spirits. He rebuked the wind just like he rebuked sicknesses. You know, you read about the news right here. The last six weeks in our country, there's been such devastation across the Midwest and other states with all of these tornadoes, such loss, and the death toll has climbed. I read about a poor man sleeping in his house and a tornado took a car, threw it through the wall of his house and crushed him in his bed. You're telling me God's throwing cars into people's houses? No, God's not doing that. Now, see, get the whole picture. Satan's come before God. He's got his eye on Job. He wouldn't be there unless he saw, you know, hey, there, there's a break in this hedge. Isn't there a hedge about him? That, that, around all he has, God said, hey, he's in your hand. But right now, you can't touch his life. Satan leaves the presence of the Lord, and all of these devastating things happen. You know, there's a line of demarcation, very clearly drawn by Jesus. John 10 and 10. Jesus said, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I came that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. It's pretty clear. I mean, think about it. Just, just, and we're going to, not this tonight, but next Wednesday, we're going to cover chapter 2 and get into some very rich parts of the book. But just think about it for a moment. The devil's trying to get God to stretch out his hand against Job. God won't do it. But just imagine. So the devil says, well, come on, come on. He, he's only worshiping you because you're good to him. And God says, well, I'll show you. I'll, I'll show you. That's not why Job's worshiping me. I'm going to make him sick. I'll, I'll take away everything he has. I'm going to kill all of his employees. That'll show you. I know they're innocent, but I'm going to kill them anyway. And I'm going to murder all of his children. I've got a great idea. I'll show you, devil. Come on. That is utter craziness to think that. That God is being provoked and inspired by the devil to murder Job's family, to murder all of his servants, to wipe out all of his sheep, to have everything stolen from him. That's not the kind of God that Jesus came to reveal to us, my friend. Our God is a good God. <clears throat> and we come to verse 20. Then Job arose. He's just received all this bad news. Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, fell to the ground and worshiped. I'm telling you, we can learn something from Job. You think about this man's integrity. He's walking in all the light that he has. He doesn't understand, and yet he's still worshiping God. Amazing. Now, before the book's done, understanding does come to Job. We read on, verse 21, and he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord is taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You can't take this statement that Job makes and turn that into New Testament doctrine. Job had a lack of knowledge. He had no scriptural reference point whatsoever. We just read in the story what Job couldn't see. God pulled the curtain back. It was the devil that took away. God gave, but it wasn't God that took away Job's health, that took away Job's family. 
that took away all of Job's possessions. And then we read in verse 22, And all this Job did not sin, nor char charge God with wrong. Now I'm going to add this. Job didn't charge God with wrong yet. See, most people have never read past chapter 2 in the book of Job. You will be shocked at some of Job's accusations against God. But the whole thing does turn around. But up to this point, Job has not accused God of wrong. And Job hasn't sinned. You know, Romans 5 and 13 says, For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. This was before the law. Job was walking in all the understanding that he had. Yet Romans 5 and 14 says, even though sin is not imputed, death still reigned all the way from Adam to Moses. Just because Job was ignorant, that didn't make him exempt from an attack of the enemy. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah chapter 5, God said, my people go into captivity because they have no knowledge. Hosea 4 and 6, God said, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. So a lack of knowledge is, is not an excuse. The devil will take advantage of anything he can. In 2 Corinthians, Paul urged them, said, look, you, you need to forgive because if we don't forgive, we give the adversary an advantage in our life. Unforgiveness gives the devil advantage and so does a lack of knowledge. He'll take advantage of anything that he can. You know, I had a friend when I first got saved, it was a, a great blessing to me. I was really surprised when I found out his story. He had been a Christian much longer than me and had married the love of his life and the marriage disintegrated. And he was estranged from his little girl. To him, his whole world had fallen apart, but he had bought in hook, line, and sinker to the idea that God was responsible for all of his troubles, that God was the one afflicting him, that God was responsible for the breakup of his marriage, God was responsible for the estrangement of his daughter, that he couldn't see her, and a whole lot of other things, just one piled on top of another, sort of like Job. You know, he gets the news about one thing, before that guy's done speaking, here comes somebody else with more bad news. Before he's done speaking, here comes more bad news. That ever happened to you? It's like wave after wave. Well, that's the way it was with him. You know, the marriage breaking up was enough. Him not being able to see his little girl was more. But then something else happened. Something else happened. Something else happened. And I remember back at that time, as I recall it, Canada was offering free land to anyone that would homestead in the Northwest Territories. You'd go into that wild country and they gave you whatever it was, seven acres or something like that. And he took off, went to the Northwest Territories of Canada, built himself a cabin and lived in utter isolation as a hermit. And he said, Bayless, I was totally into this suffering thing and the integrity of my heart. I was saying, God, I don't know why you're doing it. I miss my little girl. I don't know why all of these bad things have happened in my life. But God, I'm going to serve you anyway. And he said, I, I was completely alone. A, a supply plane would fly in, you know, maybe about 20 miles from where he was once every two weeks. And so he'd have to hike out from his cabin, get to this landing strip where the supply plane would be, and get some supplies. That was the only human being that he saw, was the guy that would drop off the supplies twice a month. But he did something, and it's a dangerous thing to do. He began to read his Bible. Everybody say, uh-oh. Uh -oh. Began to read his Bible. He read John 10 and 10. Jesus said, I came that you might have life, that you might have it more abundantly. The thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. And he began to read in the book of Job how God pulled back the curtain and began to see who was really responsible for things. And he took a hard look and basically asked the question. He said, God, you mean you're not the one afflicting me? 
This isn't all from your hand. He said it was revolutionary. It changed everything. First of all, it got rid of that deep, dark depression off of his life. He suddenly realized God was for him, not against him. Because honestly, like the lady that I began with the story in the market, if God is doing it to you, how can you pray? I mean, if, if God has made me sick, and I believe it's God, then it would be an utter act of rebellion for me to go to the doctor. Why would I enlist someone's help to get me out of the will of God? I mean, if it's God's will that I suffer with this, then, then I shouldn't try and get out of it. I should submit to his will. And it would be rebellion for me to go to the hospital or to the doctor. But I think that deep in our hearts, we know God's not our problem. God's not the one that's afflicting. God doesn't do evil. He's not using the devil as his henchman to do his dirty work. And so anyway, completely flipped everything around for my friend. Got rid of his place up there. Came back. This was when I was living in Oregon. And got reunited with his daughter, which was awesome. I met him, and he actually poured so much good into my life as a young Christian. He's, he's one of those few people that I can look back and say, man, God used this man to impact my life in a huge way. But it wasn't until things turned around. And I just want to encourage you tonight. Don't blame God for all the bad stuff. He really is good. He really is for you. He's not your enemy. He's not the adversary. He loves you. 